Hi, my name is Andrew Jones and I'm a production designer. I've been working on The Mandalorian. Uh, we have just about wrapped up season two, but I just want to go back and talk a little bit about season one and the process that we put together for this project. So uh, it's a little bit unusual in the filming process. We, we're using what we call a volume, which is on one stage, we've got a 75 foot diameter cylinder uh, with LEDs, very high resolution LED panels creating a, a round wall and a flat ceiling over the whole surface at uh, seven meters height. And on that LED wall and ceiling, we project a 3D environment. It's uh, created in Unreal and it's uh, projected onto the screens, but it's not like a translate. Translate is just a flat image that is uh, you can film against, but if you were to move the camera, you, you would realize that it's just flat. This is actually a, a proper three-dimensional uh, virtual environment and the volume includes a motion tracking system so that as the camera moves, its movement is tracked very accurately so that as it moves from position to position, the content updates to ref reflect uh, the correct point of view that that camera would see in that virtual environment. So no matter where you go, no matter where you look, you're looking th basically through the screens into the virtual environment and it's very realistic. And originally, uh, John Favreau had, had uh, been kind of working with a lot of this, these ideas on Jungle Book. There was uh, LED panels used for interactive lighting. Uh, the, the little boy in the middle of the stampede of water buffaloes. There was a screen right next to him of stampeding water buffaloes to, correct the correct, to create the correct interactive light so we didn't have to actually stampede buffaloes past him um, so that was that was kind of a, a little bit of it uh, uh, John had also uh, tasked the uh, the team to create uh, the virtual sets ahead of time so that they could be previous with and scouted and and developed uh, production designer Christopher glass worked with uh, a virtual art department to create uh, virtual sets that were scoutable and uh, before we even started shooting we were looking at what the what the environments would be like and, and blocking action in there and John took that further in the Lion King of course there's no there was no physical sets in that but uh, he was developing tools with uh, Rob Legato that would uh, create realistic camera moves with uh, in, in the virtual world and 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 scouting uh, the virtual sets in VR. So a lot of the tools that he was developing, uh, he brought to The Mandalorian along with this desire to create. Uh, on Jungle Book, we had created really beautiful little miniature sets for the kid to interact with, but everything else was blue and that's a nightmare. So the, the hope would be here that we could use LED walls with the real content, at least to contextualize the scene, to, to so you could see what was there. In the best case, we would have content on the screens that was so good that you could actually include it in the shot uh, as, a, as what's known as the final pixel now. So um, when we when we started working uh, on in Unreal, we were we were aiming at getting the highest quality visual content that in, this, in essence was photo photo real um, so the, the 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 idea of having a a screen behind the action that is filmable uh, that was our initial our, our initial um, ask but once we started testing that uh, the DP Greg Frazier realized that it's really not enough just to have beautiful beautiful content behind the performance. You need to be immerse them in a three-dimensional environment it's because it's all lighting. It's all immersing the character in the lighting of that environment. And in the case of The Mandalorian, where the character is basically wearing a silver armor, it's a reflecting the environment as well. So we kind of had no choice. If we'd done that on a blue screen, you would have had spill all over him, a lot of work to do there. Uh, so in any case, we, we didn't know if this was going to work, um, but we figured that, you know, best case, we were going to, you know, be getting in-camera finals, but at the very least, we were going to get great lighting and 
uh, be able to sort of perform the scene in what everybody could see what the set was. So this approach uh, meant that we had to really come up with a new pipeline that was going to going to work for this. We were creating essentially final content early, uh, much earlier than usual, before we even shoot, and that was going to that meant the virtual art department was going to have to create content early enough to hand it to ILM so they could ingest it into their pipeline and create the final content that was going to go on the screens way way advance. Uh, so here's a uh, flow chart that kind of describes the pipeline uh, from the art department's point of view. And uh, I'm sure each department's going to have their own view of this process, but this is, this is the art department's. You've got the uh, Lucasfilm art department, uh, Doug Chang's team up in San Francisco, working with the concept artists up there, creating amazing artwork and, and helpfully also they, they typically create 3D models to do paint over. So we're getting concept art and 3D models and the LA art department is taking those and the script and the action and starting to block out scenes. And then typically we'll, we'll just be bashing pieces out uh, in Maya and getting it into Unreal super quick just to start to look at what it what it's like. And then we're also going to be sharing our environments through Perforce with other departments, TechViz, Previz, Visual Effects. Uh, and everybody's going to be analyzing those as, as we go along, trying to figure out what we need to build, how we're going to film it. Uh, Visual Effects is looking at what the requirements are going to be and what they're going to need to do with the, the content before it gets to the screen. Perforce is great for that because we're just all working collaboratively uh, improving the set every every improvement gets propagated to everybody uh, so we we're you know very quickly working with the the DP lighting sets uh, that's uh, when when that's going to previous they're they're doing blocking on very high quality uh, scenes we're getting a lot more information um, and then when that's reached a certain level and everybody's all the creatives have bought off on on the look that's going to ilm to prepare uh, put through their pipeline to get it to be you know photo quality content that will perform on the screen at frame rate and um, all the bells and whistles so that's that's kind of uh, the process there um, there's another flow chart i want to show that uh, that also kind of shows the process broken down into stages you know design concept uh, but the interesting thing about this uh, view of, of the pipeline is that you see the virtual art department in the same zone as construction department. And that's essentially uh, what it is. That's, that's the way I look at it. The, the virtual art department is a construction department. They're just using pixels. Uh, the, the, you've got uh, sculptors, painters, fabricators, props, costumes, all of those uh, trades that you have in the traditional construction department you have in the virtual art department and they're working concurrently so if somebody is doing a, a paint sample on a physical set piece uh, uh, in the construction shop they may photograph that and give it to the virtual art department to match or vice versa if somebody working in substance painter has got some great texture that's looking great on this particular set that gets rendered sent over to the paint department Likewise, sculptors. Sculptors are building in texture on a wall that gets, uh, they're using ZBrush, whatever they're using, that, that, that goes, to, uh, go, goes to the plaster. And both of these tasks are happening simultaneously. And both of these ha are also happening way before we, we shoot it. Um, set deck, Amanda Serino, set decorator, is creating a set decoration that is going to go both in the physical world and the virtual world. If it's going to go in the virtual world, she's got to create it early enough for it to get scanned and transformed into a game asset, put in the scene and put there. And a lot of times you've got set pieces, uh, tables, dressing, whatever, that are going to appear in both. Um, so um, that, that's, that's just a great way of, of, of uh, looking at what the virtual art department is. Our virtual art department is made up of uh, artists from Happy Mushroom. On season one, we had some uh, some uh, artists from Halon as well. 
Um, these are really good game artists who, and also mixed in people from, you know, visual effects finals, uh, which, which is really important because we're not getting our, our environments to a certain level. We have to go to photo level. And even if the virtual art department isn't creating that photo level environment, we have to provide ILM with all of the elements so that they can get there. They can take it to the fo photographic level. That's a big difference with this this approach. Uh, you know, previs may may get to a point where it looks really good, but you can't hand that over to visual effects and say, you know, you got in a few weeks you got to turn that into a fo fo photo real asset. We will take photogrammetry that is uh, very high quality. Whether we resolve it to its highest level of detail or not, we need to make sure that we've got that information that we can give to ILM. So. If it's going to need to get to the to that level, they've got the wherewithal to do that. And the same with everything in the in the environment: textures, uh, geometry. It's it's all got to be heading towards photo 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 real uh, file level. One of the most interesting parts of this was how we generated the content for these environments. How we came up with the assets, and I've got some slides here that demonstrate some of that. This is a a miniature that we made for a round meeting room in uh, one of the one of the episodes to build this set physically would have been tremendously expensive uh, but we figured that we could do uh, a third of it in it as a miniature uh, scan it in make a game asset out of it duplicate it around three times to make a full 360 degrees and then that became the basis for our, our environment and uh, we've actually found that scaling up miniatures works pretty well. So um, this is the miniature and this is the physical set that uh, goes in the middle of it where the in, uh, performers need to interact with the bar and the floor. And when you bring them together, you get a, a, a scene that is is uh, very compelling. You can have interaction with smoke and light uh, from projectors, but uh, really the, the, the whole thing came together uh, very effectively without us having to build a great deal. Um, this set, um, this this is a shot of the inside of Werner's office, but uh, on a day when we were doing a lighting test with a sky in the background. So these two don't go together, but it kind of illustrates what the physical set actually is. The physical set for that uh, office was just some columns and a floor and, and dressing. And the interior of the uh, room was actually a scan of a warehouse in downtown LA that we brought into Unreal, did, did some work on, did some painting and cleanup. We likewise brought in all of the uh, set dressing that would be in the virtual content and put them together. You can see the misalignment between the wall and the ceiling here, which is because we're not viewing this from the camera's point of view. Um, but here's here it is through the camera's point of view. You can see it all marries up nicely. We lit this a number of different ways in Unreal with the, with the DP for the different scenes that play in here. Uh, it was very effective because very little physical build. We could build a set. We put it in, I think, in a day and got it out overnight. And then the next day we were ready to start another set. So that's that's like the ideal scenario for the volume. You don't want to be building a huge, complicated set. Uh, the point of this is you build a, the, the the virtual set and and that you've got it on a thumb drive and you can you can bring it back up whenever you want you don't want to be doing a lot of physical building you want to build enough for the performers to interact with and to create to receive the lighting from the virtual set uh, but ideally it's not a huge physical build having said that this one was a little bit more work just because anything with all this much sand and geology takes a little bit of time to get right but this is uh, from a scan from Utah that we brought in, scanned it, processed it, brought it into Unreal, decided where we wanted to shoot the action in VR scouting, and then chopped a little section of the physical rock out of the scan and gave that to construction to build a physical rock that matched it, which is what you see the physical rock on the right, and then put them together. And that's the, the, the shot from the final scene, which is, by the way, Untouched, I mean, you know, it got a little bit of DI, I'm sure, but that's that's what the camera saw on the day. That's the cantina. Now, uh, Richard Bluff, the visual effects supervisor from ILM, uh, went to him and said, "Look, we can't afford to build a set. Uh, we could build a bit of it. Uh, could we do this on the volume and, and have the walls be 
the on the on the content. And he 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 thought it was worth a try. You know, uh, it's a risky one, but if it works, great. If it didn't work, he was at least going to have great lighting and reflection on all those reflective surfaces. So he thought it was worth trying, and we did, and it worked fine. I think uh, we got it was all in camera. Uh, the sh the shots that we got. Um, this is the roost, which was a very big environment, and the complexity here was that the action was bigger than the volume. In other words, we had action here and then off in the distance there. Uh, so we had multiple uh, places that we had to move the volume to within the virtual environment to create, to capture the action. action. You see the sort of bridge bridge thing in the background there, that yellow, yellow structure that's in the content, uh, but we were, the action took us down there. And so when we got there, we had to have a physical version of it. And that's what this is. Actually, we did not have the virtual content in ahead of time. We built this just a couple of weeks before we shot it. So we had to get renders of the of the digital asset and match that as closely as we could in the physical, which was, you know, we, we've got that process down now. Uh, here's, here is it all come together. And of course, you can see the misalignment uh, between the wall and the ceiling uh, and the set, which is because we're not looking at it from the camera's point of view here. So uh, this process has been really intriguing. We've uh, enjoyed working with Epic in the, the virtual art department uh, all through season one. Tremendous, generous collaborators helping us figure out this process. And uh, we've, we've kind of got to a, a, a place where we are more confident about the sort of sets that we can tackle with this. And we know the ones that are more, more challenging, um, but uh, it's, it's been, uh, it, it, it's been an intriguing journey, and we, we're looking forward to, to um, continuing exploration into what the possibilities of this process uh, are. So anyway, thank you very much.